a Minneapolis police officer in the death of George Floyd. Uh, so much has happened that may be hard to remember that in the hours before that verdict was read, Republicans were railing against Democratic Congresswoman Maxine Waters and something she said during a protest in Minnesota. And Republicans tried and failed to get the congresswoman censured for that line about protesters getting more confrontational, and you can imagine the reaction over on Fox News. And Maxine Waters threatened violence before the jury had even begun to consider the facts of the case. That's so far over the line that we read some Democrats were shocked by it, and yet no one condemned it. So you're telling me Trump incited a riot by telling people to go march on the Capitol peacefully and patriotically. Those are the words, you can read the transcript, I know you have problems with that. But Maxine Waters was not inciting a riot by walking into a place known for rioting during a hot trial and saying if she doesn't get the results she wants, calling for, a, quote, a confrontation, more confrontation. Uh, this isn't a TV timeout. I'm just saying, that makes sense to you? And Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California joins me now. She's the chairwoman of the House Committee on Financial Services. Uh, Congresswoman, thanks for joining us. I want to read from an op-ed that you wrote for the LA Times. Let me put this up on screen. It says, confronting injustice has been my life's work, not because of who I am, the right wing, uh, and members of Congress who subscribe to the views of groups like QAnon, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and the KKK have targeted me. Those very people who have done uh, so to divert attention from the fact that they aided and abetted a violent domestic terrorist insurrection led by Donald Trump. To target me and say that I was violent or encouraging violence is a blatant distortion of the truth. Uh, Congresswoman uh, wanted to show that to our viewers, but looking back, why was it important for you to use that word confrontational at the time? Uh, well, let me just say that uh, you're absolutely correct uh, in um, you know reading uh, what I wrote uh, about what had happened in Minneapolis and what is happening in this atmosphere that we're in. I have been involved uh, with dealing with police abuse for many, many years. It started many years ago in Los Angeles with the killing of a woman named Eula Love, and Daryl Gates was a police chief that used chokeholds uh, to kill black men and also a battering ram uh, to tear down the doors of people in the black community. And so I have also lived with the fact that so many young unarmed men in particular and women are being being killed by the police and the black community is afraid of the police and these young boys who are getting stopped they think they may have a better chance of running than sticking with the police because the police may as was so-called happened with Dante uh, in uh, Minneapolis get killed by mistake or just get killed by the police shot in the back. It is a very, very uneasy time in the black community. The mothers and the fathers and the family are afraid for their children and particularly young black men uh, to be on the street uh, thinking that they're going to get stopped and they will not get back home. They are counseling constantly their children. Uh, if you get stopped, Please don't say anything. Please show your hands. Please say yes, sir. Do everything that you can do to keep from being killed because we can't guarantee you that the people that we pay to protect and serve you will do that rather than kill you. And so Martin Luther King was familiar with racism and discrimination. And he was familiar with how tough it is uh, to break up the established order of the day. And that was by you know white supremacists who basically created harm uh, to all in the black community for the most part. And so he created something called the C Project. The C Project was the Confrontation Project. The Confrontation Project is a nonviolent project that dealt with sit-ins, marches, praying, organizing, and so confrontational does not mean violence. 
I'm a nonviolent person. Martin Luther King taught nonviolence. And we must be about resisting, however, and we must be about educating, and we must be about trying to protect our children. And so confrontation is being misused. And as I said, there's an attempt by the Republicans to divert attention from the fact that they are aligned with violent right. people. Right. Q and Congressman. Yes. Well, Congressman, let me just ask you, though, because the judge, as you know, the judge in the Derek Chauvin case also came out strongly against your remarks. Let's listen to that. I'll give you that Congresswoman Waters may have given you something on appeal that may result in this whole trial being overturned. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case, especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch and our function. A Congresswoman's opinion really doesn't matter a whole lot. Anyway, so motion for mistrial is denied. Well, what did you think of that? What was your response to the judge uh, when you saw that? Well, he did walk it back. Uh, and as you said, he closed with, Congresswoman's opinion doesn't matter. And I think he was angry. I think he may be frustrated. Uh, with this case and how much world publicity is on it and all of that. I've talked with a lot of legal scholars and lawyers, and of course, uh, he was way off track. And he knows that, uh, in fact, the jurors were not in the room. Uh, the jurors had been uh, had an oath uh, not to look at television, uh, not to read the newspapers, not to engage with people on this. And so he knows that uh, there was no interference with the jurors. Uh, but he was uh, basically um, frustrated and angry, I believe. But I, I'm very pleased uh, that there are those who are beginning to write about Judge K uh, Cahill, Cahill's um, a basic uh, uh, comments. And one thing that I read that came from someone from CNN was uh, that the judge was all off track and he knows that this is not the cause of an appeal. Most of the time, and you have a case like this, they're going to appeal it anyway. But to say that I'm going to cause an appeal really is not credible. And whether or not they have an appeal, and even if they mention my name, uh, like the judge says, my my comments, whatever, don't matter anyway. Hmm. Well, Congressman, let me ask you more about this op-ed that you uh, wrote. You say you're nonviolent while also referencing that there are right-wing members of Congress who subscribe to the views of QAnon and the Proud Boys. Do you believe that those congressional Republicans are nonviolent? Well, no, because uh, what is very interesting is I am threatened to be killed very often. And so we are reporting, you know, to the Capitol Police and they are investigating all of these attempts to kill me. And people are so, not attempts, but, you know, people who are calling in saying that they're going to kill me. And we don't know how close they've gotten uh, to doing that. But we do know this. The Oath Keepers started to march on my office and they organized and they got very open about it. The police, LAPD, did uh, stop them, and the community turned out when they learned about it. But that doesn't get written about. Not only it, do I have my life threatened very often, and the Oath Keepers who are threatening me, but these individuals who are so brazen that they have their telephone numbers uh, that's recorded that are threatening to kill me. We have members of Congress who carry guns. And you know, we had to put uh, the machines up uh, to make sure that everybody uh, that was coming on the floor was basically going through the machine to determine whether or not they were carrying weapons. And so when you talk about violence... Are you saying, Congressman, you that you're concerned about your... Alignment. And yeah, you I look wanna... at what happened January 6th when the domestic terrorists, who are their friends, broke into our Capitol and beat up police officers and caused one police death and others to be harmed, then, you know, I think people, whether they like me or not, will know that their arguments are not credible. Let me ask you this, because right now the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act is stalled in the Senate. Uh, Democrats, as you know, don't have the 60 votes needed to bypass and filibuster. Are you concerned that Congress is going to miss a huge opportunity here, do you think? Well, I have to be concerned because, you know, uh, the Republicans have basically defined themselves and what they will and won't do and how much that they resist 
anything that has to do with taking care of the problems that we are talking about, police abuse and the targeting of black people uh, by the police. They don't want to agree to that. And so it's gonna be difficult, it's not gonna be easy. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this, that black mothers and fathers have got to do everything that they can to protect their children. We can't sleep at night, we worry about them, uh, the whole community is upset about it. And so we've got to work and we've got to deal with this issue. Protesting is guaranteed to us the freedom of speech by the Constitution of the United States of America. And so when you talk about protest and confrontation, you're not talking about hurting anybody. You're talking about educating. You're talking about, what about these. Voice. What about some you're of these state bills, about. Congresswoman? You're seeing some of these I state bills. And, well, you're seeing some of these bills in states across the country, places like Oklahoma and Florida, where they are trying to place restrictions on protesting. They're calling them anti-riot bills and so on. Have you seen this? And what is your yes, response to some to of these bills? Yes, I'm beginning to take a look at this. And I am remembering as I started looking at this, that they're saying that if a car plows into a crowd and kills somebody, uh, that it depends on what that somebody was doing, that they may not be held accountable for that. And I don't know the exact words, but the, the that legislation that they're producing is outrageous. It is unconstitutional, but it is similar to what they're doing on voting rights. We're under attack on voting rights with, you know, all of these states uh, that have Republican governors, et cetera. Uh, they are basically, trying to take away our voting rights. It is voter suppression that cannot be denied. In addition to that, now you have an attempt to stop protesting and First Amendment rights. The black communities are under siege uh, by these right-wing Republicans, the KKK, uh, the QAnon, uh, uh, the Oath Keepers, NRA. Uh, the Proud Boys. These are domestic terrorists, uh, and they are targeting us in so many ways, and unfortunately, our young people are dying, and we just have to keep talking. We have to keep acting. All right, and we know you will. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, thanks for coming in. We appreciate your time. Uh, we hope to have you on again soon. We appreciate it. Thank you so very much for having me. All right, thank you. And coming up, the dangerous comments from Republican Senator fanning the flames of vaccine hesitancy by asking what's the point as thousands still die every day around the world from the pandemic. I want to stop it right there to be able to weigh in on what has been said by um, by this particular uh, Maxine Walters representative. I feel for the black community just like I feel for the Native American community. The Native American community today does not get discussed hardly at all. And the reason why is because society is so ashamed of what they've done to the Native American community. They'd rather not talk about it. Sweep it under the rug, out of sight, out of mind. It's basically the same thing that happened during the Spanish uh bubonic plague that broke out back in the 1800s or 1918 excuse me there wasn't a lot of ri written reports on that particular event even though it was a major event here in this country and the reason why was because people was ashamed of how they responded and how they reacted during a pandemic I understand what Maxine is talking about pertaining to non-violent controversial. This was the very thing that I told a young lad working in a convenience store in Martin, Tennessee in 2005. I told him because of the controversy that was going on in my life in regard to interpreting Bible prophecy because of the controversy that I was probably going to wind up on the Channel 6 News. This was in 2005. 
That's whenever the police officers in Martin went all the way, jumped from one county to two counties over, Carroll County, and come in and apprehended me and interrogated me in their own precinct about what did I mean whenever I said I was probably going to wind up on the Channel 6 News, that there was going to be an explosion of controversy in my life. And sure enough, it has been. But once more, just because you use the word controversy does not mean that it's in a violent type form. You can have an explosion of, of seismograph activity. You can have, a, a metaphorically, you can have a, 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 an explosion of Bermuda grass that winds up devastating your garden. You can have an explosion of corrupt politics that we're seeing right now uh, across, across our great nation. You can have controversy and it not be presented in a violent form. That's exactly what I meant whenever I said what I meant in 2005 up here in Martin, Tennessee, but yet no, they arrested me. I hired a bad attorney by the name of Benjamin Dempsey that made me uh, basically plead guilty to a misdemeanor charge of this, of this type of a charge and it wound up costing me my job. It costed me my marriage. It costed me five acres. It costed me um, half a million dollars in profit sharing and five acres on a mini farm. And I had to declare bankruptcy and move Plum out of the area and go to Davison County. And it wasn't long until I moved to Davison County. Here comes Secret Service towards snooping into my life. I've had police officers, bad police officers, law enforcement police officers, that has purposely targeted me and purposely lied about me. So what Maxine is talking about, I empathize and sympathize with her. Because, you know, I was just thinking about that. I think it was last night. I was thinking about it driving down the road. I thought, why is the police officers doing this? And the only thing that I could come up with was because Black people get emotional, and some of them get highly emotional, especially if they're already upset to begin with. And I think because it's such of a high pitch coming from the Black community whenever they are being scrutinized by a police officer, I think it's freaking the police officers out to the point that they don't know what this high pitch is all about, and the next thing you know, they wind up laywaying into them towards killing them. In other words, the black people are not quite as kosher as the white people whenever it comes to white people being less verbal. Black people are more verbal whenever it comes to their emotions because they have went through so much through the slave era and all the other stuff, and they know that they're being discriminated against and targeted, same way with myself, being targeted by law enforcement right here in the same county that I'm living in right now in Weekly County, Tennessee. Have I had any of these police officers apologize? Have I had any of these judges apologize? Have I seen any type of movement in this county pertaining to people that actually support the windmill ministries because of it supporting wide world global peace. No. And because of it, things is just going to get worse. And let it fall upon to them because this is the environment that they've created. They wanted it this way. They lied to the American people about how that the nuclear arms agreement ever got, got uh, accomplished during Ronald Reagan's administration. They've lied to the American people pertaining to what actually went on down in Mount Karma, Waco, Texas. They have lied to the American people towards what actually occurred in the Oklahoma bombing. They have lied to the people pertaining to my, my particular situation and, and putting out all these false narratives and, and telling all these lies. It's the fish story that begins a six-inch fish, eight-inch fish, 12-inch fish, and the next thing you know, it turns into a whale. These are 
tactics. Tactics that are being used towards targeting various people for various reasons. We are at war. Just like Maxine said, we are under siege. And we are. And if it's not coming from one area, it's coming from another. And it's really, really sad because you would think, you would think because of so many different churches here in America, you would think whenever it comes to religion that I have the right to interpret the Bible just the same as everybody else. But because my interpretation is a little bit in is a little bit differently than everybody else's, now all of a sudden I get blackballed. Now all of a sudden I get hung out to dry. Well, that's exactly what the church world has done in my life for the past 30 plus years because they didn't want my type of peace that I talk about that is actually coming from the Bible. I didn't predict the Bible. I didn't predict the things that's in the Bible. I have made some predictions that are in fact coming true regardless whether it be electrical disturbances or a bloody road ahead or the election of, of uh, Trump losing the election, I have made some predictions that have come true, all of them in that regard. So where I stand is on two different levels. I stand by accomplishing the predictions that an individual put out to the world about 90 years after the birth of Jesus Christ that was called John the Revelator on the island of Patmos. And plus I'm dealing with my own personal predictions that I have made that is causing controversy in my particular life. Once more, I haven't ever been violent. I've had individuals that wanted to draw me into violence. I've had them try to provoke me into violence. I've been thrown into violent atmospheres, such as jails, state jails, county jails, federal jails, being studied. But I did not take up violence. And you can look at my record, because I guarantee you, as many times as I've been in and out associated with law enforcement, they have recorded every incident, and they cannot find not one where I become violent. But yet, no. Society still treating me like I'm violent. Once more, this has been that that uh, that phobia that people have created in their own minds because of the fish story going from this big, this big, this big, and now it's a whale. Um, the people, by and large, is 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 you know got problems. Studio uh, fanatics and, and paranoid fanatics pertaining to this and that. And whenever it comes to their true walk with God, their true relationship with the Lord, they know as well as I do that their talk does not line up with their walk. In other words, they're full of hypocrisy. And even Christ said that if you wasn't willing to lay down your life for me, even as I was willing to lay down my life for you, that you're basically not worthy for his love. You're not worthy of his love. And because it is a deep, controversial subject, it has caused controversy in my life. Just like Miss Maxie. Now she's having to explain to the world that she did not have any type of harmful intent whenever she used the word controversy. But you got to realize the statement that she made is right on the money because it is a controversial subject pertaining to racial discriminating events that have flared up in America, such as I personally have never seen before, even as a youngster pertaining to the civil rights movement. I've never seen this type of atmosphere that has been created here in America. And if we don't get a hold over it, if we don't take the initiative towards taking control over it, eventually it's going to take control of us. And the next thing you know, we're all going to wind up in a bloodbath over here. And that's exactly what our enemy 
overseas would like for us to do towards fighting amongst ourselves. That way, once we become weakened with our own with our own idiotic idioticacy uh, misbehavior, then the enemy will come in and just basically take us over, walk in, because we'll almost be out of bullets and we'll be so weakened. I mean, I don't even know why that that the president before the one that we have right now didn't already declare America in a state of an emergency pertaining to civil war. And the more that I see it every day that's happening here and there and there and here, we're basically at the state of a civil war here in the United States. And I know that they don't want to officially declare that kind of like they don't want to officially declare that America is bankrupt, even though we're about 30 something odd trillion dollars in debt. But if we do not come to the reality of reality of where we are and what is happening, the ship is going to go down and it's not just going to go down for, for a few of us. It's going to go down for everybody. And that's the reason why Mac, I believe that Maxine, the representative here, has gotten on TV and she has voiced her uh, analogies or her ideologies to to be able to enlighten the American people that, no, she was not ad advocating any type of violence on the streets pertaining to protest. But at the same time, she's standing guard in understanding that these various laws that these uh, states are are uh, implementing like Oklahoma, that it's another move towards taking away our freedoms that our ancestors died for pertaining to the right to protest, the right for free speech, the right for other things. She's like wearing two or three different hats here. But at the same time, she's explaining herself as, as I have, to the judges, to the courts, to various attorneys, to various law enforcement agencies, I have explained myself, but yet now I get no apology. I get no confirmation. And the world continues to go upside down. The country continues to go upside down. So whatever has befallen upon to the American people, at this point in time, the only thing that I can say is that the adult society, not so much the children, but the adult society has continued to let this fester. They have continued to let this escalate. They have continued to pour more gas on the fire. And whenever it comes to the end of all this arguing and bickering and killing and shooting and, and destroying each other's lives, it's going to take a supernatural revival of reviving our relationship with God so that we will become closer to our relationship with God and these things will end and our land will become healed. Until then, it's only going to get worse. And I tend to wonder if a lot of them out there desires for, the, for it to be worse because they're not openly protesting. They're not openly voicing their opinions about what's wrong and what's right. They're not standing up against unfair justice and, and, and doing the right thing. So because I see a, a, two different societies in this culture over here in America, and I'm basically seeing the same thing in Russia, I'm seeing the same thing in South America, I'm seeing the same thing in Mexico, I'm seeing the same thing in other countries, I'm seeing two different societies that is struggling that cannot meet an agreement towards reaching each other in the middle. And that's exactly what Satan is doing right now for so the Bible says that he's out to kill, steal, and destroy, and that he is an author of confusion. Whenever I put my material out to the general public, 
Usually it's a reason in behind me putting out what I'm putting out. Just like today, I put out by trying to use an analogy that basically it was kind of like a blind date. I just got to talking to my niece out in California. I told her, I said, I feel like that the church communities, the so-called church communities, has basically entrapped me or they have uh, set me up that since I was just a young child, all I heard growing up in the Bible Belt area was, was the end time events, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, the antichrist, the new world order, the two witnesses, the opening of the seals, uh, the devil, God, good, bad, etc., and now all of a sudden, somebody like me that's been anointed by God to actually help to demonstrate or help to bring these occurrences into focus, now all of a sudden, I'm a madman. Now all of a sudden, I'm this or I'm that. Once more, these stereotypes that's out here, they, don't, they wouldn't know the truth if they was to stumble over it. And they are dictating and leading people in the wrong direction. Kind of like the, what the Bible says, the blind leading the blind. That's what's happening. And people need to wait, awaken towards what's happening here. Because it's not just happening in my life. It's not just happening in Miss Maxie's life. But it's happening in a great deal of our lives here in America. You know, I just bumped into a woman the other day over in Kenton, Tennessee. She looked at me with tears in her eyes. She said, you know what? I'm ready. I said, what do you mean you're ready? I go, are you ready to, to go home and be with Jesus? She said, yes, I am. She said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of this planet called Earth. And I'm, I have went through so much struggling with pain and agony and this, that, and that. And, and there's just no, it's just relentless. She said, I'm ready. I'm ready to go ahead and die and go home and be with God. And, you know, I could feel her anxiety. I could feel her passion of feeling like that her morale had just been beaten down to a pulp. I could feel that. Once more, I emphasize today that the church community, by and large, that I was framed by the so-called church community towards going ahead and displaying the things about the end time biblical Bible prophecy on the same level as somebody going on a blind date and your date standing you up. In other words, of all the people that I thought would not turn and run and hide is in fact the very people that's turning and running and hiding and not supporting the things that I'm teaching and preaching about. And because of it, I'm also seeing on the other perspective towards things evolving and getting worse and worse and worse. I don't know what they think that they're going to get out of this unless they're just purposely trying to piss God off to the point that God comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance upon the world towards burning everything down to the ground and, and casting us off into great tribulation. That's the only thing that I can think of is that the meanness and the, and the cold hardness of society has become so cruel and unjust that they're actually wanting to go out in some sort of a big bang. Well, I got news for them. You can want in one hand and poo-poo in the other and see which one fills up the quickest because God is not going to come back until he wants to come back. It doesn't matter how much people want to provoke him into getting angry. God will not come back until it's time for God to come back. And then, and only then, God will come back. In the meantime, we have the comforter here, which is a part of God that's working for God, that's still helping us achieve some of these heartaches, some of these hurdles that we're all having to uh, be exposed to on one level or the other. And and I, I keep telling people that it's all based around the first three chapters of Revelations where he's speaking to the churches and telling them that he has not found our works perfect yet. 
to go back, go back, go back, and do thy first works over again. For he has not found our works perfect yet. We haven't reached that perfect, perfect, uh, perfect union of, of who we are and what we are supposed to be. And because of it, we're seeing hardship. We're seeing Satan rise up in great wrath, just as the Bible talks about, for he knows that he has lost in this competition. And because of it, he's rising up, causing that much more remorse and grief to society. It says that he will come, come up and rise up in great wrath because he knoweth his time is short is exactly what the Bible teaches. Once more, the stuff that I'm talking about, the stuff that I'm teaching, the stuff that I'm walking out into the eyes of the general public about is in fact controversial pertaining to the old thinking of the old church that thought that whenever God returned back, everybody instantaneously was just going to vanish and every molecule in their body was going to be transfigurated from mortal to immortal in the twinkling of an eye. There was a movie that came out a few years ago called Left Behind, where airplanes was falling out of the sky, taxi drivers was running into buildings, uh, just total chaos had erupted on the planet Earth because God had taken out the elect or the saints from this earth. That was a good analogy of a supernatural opinion that somebody had, but it wasn't the right analogy. It was not the analogy that has already done been pre-selected, pre-written in the book of Revelations towards just exactly how it's going to happen because it's on God's timetable. Now, it doesn't say when it's going to happen, but it, but it does say how it's going to happen pertaining to a purging whenever the opening of the second seal, the red horseman, opens up, and no one can open that seal but Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain. It talks about how that there will be a purging of how that the non-Christians will actually think they're doing God a favor by taking out the true Christians until God returns in flaming fire, taking revenge upon them who know not God. And at that point in time, they're going to realize that what that they was a part of was evil towards, towards per, being a part of purging the earth pertaining to a massacre that's going to take place all over the planet. They're going to realize that they have failed God in a fundamental deep way. And that's whenever people will run to the altars. They'll have to make their own altars because the majority of the churches are going to be burnt down to the ground. Every building, every structure that's burnable will be burnt down to the ground. But that's whenever people are going to realize that they have missed out on the first resurrection. Now, if you'll read on down into the sixth and seventh chapter of Revelations, you will see where it talks about of those who was as the sands of the sea that washed their robes white in the Lamb's blood during the seven-year tribulation period that did not take the mark. And because they did not take the mark, the Bible says that they must sleep for a short season until it is time for them to be awoken. Somewhere between chapter 6 and chapter 12, I don't know where, but there's going to be a second resurrection. And I may have moved that a little bit too too. Uh, aggressively, it may be on up into the 17th or 18th chapter, but there's going to be a second resurrection. And then finally, there's going to be a third resurrection where the Bible says that the sea and all that is in the sea will give up its dead. That means that anybody that's ever been created with two arms, two hands, two feet and a head and a body that has any type of mind at all, that they will be judged during the great white throne judgment. 
after the judgment has been has been sealed by God and God alone. It says that Lucifer, the one that was in captivated in prison for a thousand years, the Antichrist, the false prophet, will be loosed for a short season to deceive him again into Gog and Magog. This will all be basically in the supernatural realm at this point in time. In the existence of the supernatural realm, there will be just as many once more again that will follow after this demonic, insensitive, cruel entity. As God said that fire will come out of New Jerusalem that will consume them that followed after Satan the final and last time. And that's when God and God alone will grab up Lucifer, Satan, and a third of the angels that followed with them, and they will be cast into hell where they will scream unmercifully for the rest of their days because they challenged the heavenly kingdom and they have failed. They have failed in their attempts to overthrow the kingdom. And because they have failed, they will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. But it won't be man's law. It will be God's law. Because there is penalty. There is punishment for disobeying God. There always has been. There always will be. Punishment for those who willfully disobey God. Thank you for listening. Good luck to all of us. And once more, as we always end our message to the general public, Shalom, and God bless you, and God bless America for you listening in. Thank you.